Today on Blue 58, our draft preview series takes us to two of the most difficult positions to evaluate, quarterback and offensive line. The Packers arguably need one of both, so what do they do here? Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink, happy to be with you here for another episode. I've got a lot of sort of little things I want to talk about on the show today. To to start with what I mentioned in the intro, uh, our draft preview series is going to touch on quarterbacks and offensive line prospects here. I've done a bit of work already on quarterbacks, so I'm not going to dive super deep on that class for that reason. And also, basically, if you want to draft a quarterback, you got to do it early. That was the, the sort of thesis we came up with earlier this offseason, and that is basically held up as well. Offensive line is just a tough one, and I think everybody sort of intuitively understands that now, or just generally. I think you're really kidding yourself if you think you can identify valuable offensive line prospects outside of the guys that everybody thinks are the top two or three tackles in the league or in the draft class. It's tough. Unless you're sitting down and grinding tape like at a professional level, it's going to be really hard to identify a good prospect. So we're not going to go super deep on either of those other two positions. There are a couple other things that I wanted to talk about today, though, starting with fullbacks. Uh, The Packers have lost theirs to the New England Patriots. Or have they? In case you've forgotten, the Packers do have another fullback around. His name is Elijah Wellman, and we talked about him a little bit late last season. He was signed uh, just kind of as a a late-season pickup, a futures contract, Six foot two, 240 pound, 41 pound prospect out of West Virginia. He's played for the Washington Redskins, not in any sort of meaningful sense, but he's been around a little bit. In the past, I've described him as sort of a Danny Vitale like player. He's a very athletic guy, uh, could play a little bit of running back. Uh, the Redskins looked at him a little bit in that direction, uh, just as sort of a depth running back. But he is much more of a traditional fullback. And I wonder if that could be the Packers tipping their hand a little bit towards what they want to do with that position going forward. We know that Danny Vitale was not a traditional fullback. He was not a typical stick your helmet in a linebacker's chest, blow him up, gashing through the middle of the line type road grader fullback. He was a super back like he was at Northwestern. He would, you know, leak down the seam, do athletic fullback things. In addition to doing a little blocking, the Packers never really seemed to find a role for him doing that. They kind of seemed to want him to be the run blocker, the traditional fullback type. But that wasn't really his game, and it sort of it didn't really work out. And I think the Packers showed that it didn't really work out by not seeming all that interested in bringing him back and letting him go to the Patriots on a pretty reasonable deal. Not a super expensive contract there. Wellman seems like he could mark a shift at the position for the Packers. If they do indeed keep a fullback around for this fall, I think it seems likely that they're going to keep a guy more like Elijah Wellman, the blocking type fullback. Then, if you want a guy who does the Danny Vitale type things, you sprinkle in a guy like Robert Tanyan or Jay Sternberger, both who have done fullback things for the Packers in the past. I think we're seeing a little bit of a philosophical shift here. Danny Vitale was a nice prospect. He didn't really fit what the Packers wanted to do with fullbacks. We're already seeing some evidence of of at least a philosophical change for the Packers in that direction. And boy, I know you're thinking, John, it's really great that you're leading off this podcast with the great stuff, the the big, heavy-hitting topics that we're all thinking about. And, you know, fullbacks have been foremost in my mind. So just thank you for spending a little bit of time talking about that. And to that, I say you're welcome. I, I'm I'm very glad that I could scratch that itch for you. Uh, it's been It's been, you know, bothering me for a while, and I just had to get those fullback thoughts out there. A little bit more in the mainstream interest other than fullback is wide receiver. And I want to talk about wide receiver for a second today uh, because of news today that Robbie Anderson has signed with the Carolina Panthers. A two-year, $20 million deal. First year is going to get him about $12 million. 
it seems like a good deal for Robbie Anderson because the wide receiver market seemed pretty well dried up, or at least very cold if you were a wide receiver looking for a contract. It's tough out there. There have not been a lot of big money deals for wide receivers. And to be fair, there haven't been a lot of like gotta have it type wide receivers. Not even a guy who like priced himself out of his original team. It was more guys that had been with teams and the teams are just kind of like, eh, see what you can get. Uh, Maybe we'll have a conversation later. That seems like the ultimate description of Robbie Anderson, a guy who does some things fairly well, but mostly just runs fast. And so the Jets are just like, okay, see what you can get. And they weren't interested in having any further conversations about it. A lot of people have seemed to want the Packers to play in the wide receiver free agent market. I think it's a tough market to play in for reasons that we've talked about in the past. Back when we did our preview series piece on wide receivers on this very podcast, I talked about the wide receiver store being an expensive place to hang out. It seems like that store where they don't really have prices on anything. You got to take it up to the front and they're like, and you're like, how much is this? Well, if you got to ask, it's a problem first and foremost. But then it always ends up being way more than you think it should be. I don't hang around in a lot of stores like that, you might guess. Um, Pretty typical dad apparel for me. Uh, But that's what shopping for a wide receiver always feels like. If you're on the market for a free agent wide receiver, the price is always going to be more than you probably think it should. Even for Robbie Anderson, who encountered a bit of a cold wide receiver market, it probably was not as much as, as he would have thought he would get, but still, quite a lot. The Packers really didn't have the cap space to play in that kind of market. But they do need help at wide receiver. Anybody who says that the Packers should be playing the wide receiver game at free, uh, in free agency does have a point. They can keep saying that because they're not wrong. The Packers need help at wide receiver. But how did, this, how did they get to this point and... Where do they go from here? It's a piece I've been working on for the Power Sweep for a while. I want to take a a quick look at it here today, kind of talk through what I've done so far. I'm calling it the past, present, and future of Packers wide receiver. Because the reason the Packers are in this position, well, there are several. Um, And it all kind of goes back to Brian Gutekunst's first year on the job with the Packers. Cast your mind back to the spring of 2018. Brian Gutekunst has been on the job for just a couple months now, and he's already made a couple big moves. One of them was to release Jordy Nelson. And fair or not, people viewed Jordy Nelson's release as kind of a chip that you could use to free up some cap space. That's what it was functionally, but anybody who got slotted into the, the salary kind of range that Jordy Nelson was in was going to be viewed as his replacement. And that's where Jimmy Graham comes in, because fair or not, I think a lot of people, at least early on, viewed him as a Jordy Nelson replacement, and I think it's easy to see why. He did a lot of things that, or was supposed to do at least, a lot of things that Jordy Nelson did well late in his career, line up in the slot, figure out soft spots and zones, and perform well in the red zone and especially down by the goal line. That obviously didn't work out, but you can see where the thinking was there. That's what the Packers needed from Jimmy Graham. That's what Jordy Nelson did. So you can see why the Packers would be interested in Jimmy Graham at least and why people would think that Jimmy Graham was something of a Jordy Nelson replacement. But this is kind of where the Packers receiver problems start because even if Jimmy Graham did the things that Jordy Nelson was supposed to do, he is not a wide receiver. The Packers needed help at wide receiver. And I know there's a couple people on the Packers beat that are like, well, Jimmy Graham actually is a wide receiver. He's not. Functionally, he's not. He doesn't play like a wide receiver. He does some wide receiver things, but he's a tight end. The Packers needed help at wide receiver after Jordy Nelson left, and they never really seem to have gotten there. But there is something else that happened in the spring of 2018 that I think is still affecting the Packers today. The Packers came out of that free agency dog pile with Jimmy Graham, but they were also in the mix for Allen Robinson, who ended up signing with the Chicago Bears. Now, he actually says that he picked the Bears over the Packers, making it seem like their offers were more or less on par with each other. And I don't even want to talk about the numbers there, because I think if you look at what Jimmy Graham got and you look at what Allen Robinson got, they're similar enough that you could 
basically view it as a one-to-one comparison. The Packers came out of there with Jimmy Graham. I think they should have done what they could to make sure that they came out of the spring of 2018 with Allen Robinson. Because if you're looking for big, relatively fast wide receivers to replace a big, formerly fast wide receiver in Jordy Nelson, Allen Robinson seems like a pretty good solution. The Packers didn't get him. And instead, they had to turn to the NFL draft, where they selected Jermon Moore, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, and Equinemia St. Brown. I made the case all the way back then that the Packers still need a veteran, needed a veteran wide receiver because counting on rookie wide receivers to contribute in a significant way is historically pretty foolish. Generally speaking, they don't produce a whole lot, and that was more or less true in the case of those three, though I think both Marquez Valdez-Scantling and Equinemia St. Brown vastly outperformed expectations. Statistically, at least, they had very productive rookie years. Jermon Moore, not so much. But you could see at least what the Packers were thinking there. Their thought process wasn't necessarily good, as it would turn out, but you could see what they were thinking in Jamon Moore. Big, fast guy. Sure, he has questionable hands, but he runs pretty decent routes, and if he gets those hands figured out, he will sort of blossom into a, a worthwhile wide receiver. Well, stepping forward into 2019, he didn't figure it out. He's cut. Marquez Valdez-Scantling does not take a step forward after his rookie season. In fact, takes a few big steps backwards. He is well behind both Geronimo Allison and Jake Kumaro by the time the season ends. Mostly watching from the sidelines as the season wears on. And Equinemius St. Brown, of course, had his rookie season ruined by his injury near the tail end of preseason. Those three draft picks from 2018 have not really developed, I think, how the Packers would have hoped. Should they have hoped for three late round draft picks to develop the way that they did, or to develop at all, really, I think is a, is a fair question. Probably not, but they put a lot of eggs in that basket. Now heading into 2020, the Packers still do not really have an adequate replacement for Jordy Nelson. What's worse, they also have not replaced the production of Randall Cobb, such as it was in 2018. Production aside, they just have not found competent, reliable wide receivers to put opposite Devontae Adams, and that's the real problem. Alan Lazard is fine, but I don't think he's a number two, and none of their draft picks have really developed to that point. So what do the Packers really still have to do here? I think there are three options ahead of them. They can trade for a wide receiver, they can sign a free agent, or they can draft a wide receiver or preferably multiple wide receivers. And I've said this before, but I think we need to say it again. For the Packers to fix this wide receiver position, and it does need to be fixed, I think they have to still do two of those three things. They need some big swings at wide receiver. And there are still some big swings available. So a big swing, a trade. I still think Odell Beckham Jr. should be an option. Not saying he's the greatest idea in the world. I would admit there's a possibility that could blow up in the Packers' face. But the contract numbers work. You could make it happen if you had to. And he would be the best wide receiver prospect the Packers have had since ever. I mean, 30 years? Is he the best wide receiver that they've had, at least on paper, coming in? It's pretty close to, I mean, anybody you put up there is, is it's going to be a tough argument to convince me that they are better than Odell Beckham Jr. It's an option. It's out there. A reworked contract could put Sammy Watkins in play from Kansas City. That, too, is an option. Free agency, Brashad Perriman is still out there. Not saying he will fix all of their problems, but he would represent, I think, an upgrade over anybody other than Devontae Adams currently on the roster. At least he would give them another big, fast receiver who has proven he can do it at the NFL level. And then in the draft, I think the Packers have to take a receiver in the first two rounds. Depending how the draft breaks, I would not at all be disappointed to see them take one in the first round. I would prefer for the Packers to come out of the draft this spring with multiple wide receivers. 
That, I think, is the investment they need to get this wide receiver position figured out. They have to do at least two of those three things, I think. Sign a wide receiver, trade for a wide receiver, draft a wide receiver high, or take multiple wide receivers in the draft to fix this position group. I think they have to view this as an offensive offseason. Last year, they finally seemed to really invest into the defense in a meaningful way beyond the draft, and it paid off. The defense wasn't perfect, just see how the season ended, but it was better. And it had some good things in place. Good pass rushers, reliable secondary, not a great secondary, but a reliable one, and a defense that just seemed competent. Yep, didn't always perform at a high level. They got aware of that NFC Championship performance forever, probably. And it was even a conversation of whether or not Mike Pettin should be back. Not apparently for Matt LaFleur, but for us at least. But the point is they invested big into the defense. The Packers need to do that on offense. And wide receiver is the best place to start. They haven't really ever done it in the Aaron Rodgers era. It's time to start. Moving to something completely different, let's talk for a second about the draft again. I still believe that it's a bad idea to really count on a quarterback prospect from anywhere other than the first couple rounds. Certainly day one or two. First round or second round. Maybe even the third round, if you're real lucky. It's hard and unlikely to find a quarterback that everyone else has missed that is an NFL prospect. That's not to say it doesn't happen. It does. But chances are, teams are going to figure out how to find the most valuable valuable position in football. And as a result, most of those quarterbacks end up going in the first round. First or second round, at the very least. But I think there's a chance that there is some value out there. So I'd like to talk for a second about three quarterbacks that I think would be a good value for the Packers. And I'm basing this around my Acme Packing Company colleague Paul Noonan's work on his quarterback on base plus plugging plus slugging percentage stat. I've linked a, a piece, linked to a piece explaining how that all works in your show notes. So check that out. Um, but I think there are three guys worth really taking a look at here. A guy who I would take if he falls, a guy I think nobody is talking about, and a guy who the numbers support, who I'm just interested in for no real reason beyond that. Realize that sounds like a pretty shallow pool of quarterbacks, but it is what it is. The Packers are probably not going to have a swing at a great quarterback at 30, and I'm not even sure they should take one even then. But if they did get a shot at Tua Tagovailoa at 30, I think they should take him. Everybody seems to understand that he's a pretty good player, um, but I think there's a chance he could be extra special. I like his athleticism. I like how he throws the ball. And I like that there is a chance that he could fall. I am not super worried about his injury situation. From what I've read, it seems like he's back on the right track. Take that for whatever it's worth. Probably nothing. Um, But it doesn't seem like his leg is going to fall off anytime soon here. I have had a little bit of concern about Alabama guys in the past, but um, quarterbacks seem like a little bit of a different animal. So if he falls, I would take Tua. That's not really that out there of a take. I think a lot of people would do that. But as far as players nobody is talking about who could be a value later in the draft, let's start with Tyler Huntley. He's Utah's quarterback. And according to our colleagues' work, he is potentially a sleeper opportunity here in the draft. He does a really good job attacking down the field. He's relatively reliable with his accuracy. He has some physical tools. Big, strong guy, but what quarterback isn't these days? Um, But he looks a little bit unrefined. Nevertheless, the production is there, and his production is such that he could be a good value prospect. 
the guy I'm interested for no re- in for no real reason other than the numbers and, and just kind of, I don't know, the overall package being interesting, is Jalen Hurts. I know there is a bunch of atypical stuff about him. He looks a lot more like a running back in some ways than a quarterback. Uh, he's got the spread stigma against him playing at o- Oklahoma. He lost his job in Alabama. I get all that. But his story is interesting to me. He's productive in the right ways. And he seems like he just has this whole being a quarterback thing figured out. And I I can't really think of a better way to put it than that. Being a quarterback is more than just what you do. I almost want to call it a lifestyle. I think you get what I'm saying about it. There's more to quarterbacks than, than just what they do completing passes and and doing handoffs. There's more to being a quarterback than that. Aaron Rodgers gets dinged for a lot of that other stuff, the body language, the leadership, stuff like that, for completely unfair reasons, I've always argued. But I think it's just proof that there is more to being a quarterback than just the numbers. Jalen Hurts seems to have that part really figured out. And that's interesting to me. It's especially interesting as a backup quarterback type prospect. It's especially interesting as a backup quarterback type prospect for a coach who seems to have a lot better idea of how to tailor a system to a guy's strengths than his predecessor. If the Packers are looking for a backup quarterback, a guy with an atypical skill set might not be that bad of an option anymore. Deshaun Kaiser and before him Brett Hundley were, at least I think as far as uh, Mike McCarthy was concerned, pretty atypical. They were not a traditional drop back and throw it quarterback. Neither one. And he couldn't really make it happen with either of them. And there are some other reasons too. Turns out neither of them were that great. But I think if if anyone could make it work, it's Matt LaFleur. He seems to have that part of being a coach figured out. Those are three names to watch. And that's really, I guess, how I'm approaching this entire draft prep prospect process. Not guys that are going to go at certain slots in the draft. Not guys that I think the Packers should take first round, second round, third round. Just people I think are interesting. Guys that are worth watching. And I think those are three that are worth watching for the Packers. Tua, if he falls. Tyler Huntley, if you want to go way off the mat. The guy who just seems to have it figured out in Jalen Hurts. Finally, let's talk about offensive line for a little bit. It is just about impossible, I think, for the casual fan to have any sort of substantive take about the offensive line. I've really tried. I've tried with uh, the, the numbers that we've put together to add a little bit more context to our discussion around the offensive line. But as far as prospects coming out into the draft, it, it's hard to, to really do any sort of substantive content on the offensive line. But I think there are some kind of breadcrumbs here about what the Packers have done on the offensive line that I think could help us identify some prospects. There are three things that I think you should look for. First is just raw athleticism. Just in general, Brian Gutekunst has shown a strong preference for athleticism. Just overall athlete. How well can he move, jump, push things, whatever. The testing numbers, the, the the entirety of the testing stuff, Brian Gutekunst loves. He loves him a good athlete. As far as athletes go, the Packers seem to really like tackles in particular who played tight end or players generally who have a wrestling background. The Packers love cross-trained athletes, so tight end who became tackles or guys who have played multiple sports, especially wrestling, but also basketball. Then I think the Packers are also going to be look for looking for smallish tackles who can play guard. I've always referred to it as the the tackle to guard pipeline in Green Bay. There's been a long history of Packers tackles or guys who played tackle in college ending up at guard for the Packers. So Josh Sitton played tackle, TJ Lang played tackle, even started out in Green Bay as a tackle. Uh, there was a legitimate competition at one point between him and Brian Bulaga for a tackle spot. People forget that. It was 10 years ago, 
but uh, that was a thing that happened. Look it up. Uh, Don Barkley, um, even Elton Jenkins has a bit of a tackle background. Guards work or tackles work team tend to work pretty well at guard in the NFL. And I'm I'm willing to bet that if uh, if tackle did not work out for uh, David Bakhtiari, he would have ended up at guard for the Packers because a lot of people thought he was a guard coming out anyway. So there's three broad categories for you to be looking for. Guys who are athletic in general, guys specifically who have done other athletic things other than other than tackle, and then smallish tackles who can play guard. Of the tackles, of the offensive tackles who performed at the combine, a dozen had a relative athletic score of eight or better. To narrow our pool a little bit, I've subtracted the guys who are considered by ESPN to be top 10 tackles because I figure all of those guys will probably be gone by the time the Packers pick at 30. So that takes Mekhi Becton, Tristan Wirfs, Austin Jackson, and Jedrick Wills out of consideration for us. That leaves us with another eight tackles. And of those, I think there are four that really jump out to me. Ezra Cleveland out of Boise State has a background in wrestling, uh, played on the defensive line in in high school. That is something I could see the Packers being interested in. Maybe not in the first round, but just in general. Matthew Pert out of UConn started as a basketball player, only ended up playing football at all because um, people thought you're a giant dude, you might do pretty well at football. Turns out he did, and he's going to end up being a, an NFL draft pick as a result. Jack Driscoll out of Auburn is a, a short arm tackle. A lot of people think he could be a guard just because of his size. And then Alex Taylor out of SC State is another multi-sport athlete type person. I think that's all the deeper we need to go in offensive line talk at this point. Unless the Packers actually start picking guys, I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to guess who projects into a zone scheme, what position they might want to play, who's a potential swing tackle, because all I'm really going to be doing is, is reading back other people's scouting reports. Those are about as broad of, the, of a guidelines as I can give you, uh, talking about who the Packers might be interested in. And I think there is a real chance that could produce a prospect for us to talk about at actual draft time. That could be somebody the Packers end up taking. Is that definitively who they'll end up taking? Almost certainly not. But I think that's the general direction we should be going. What do you think about quarterbacks in the draft? What do you think about offensive linemen? Should the Packers be looking at taking either one or both early in the draft? I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. YouTube listeners in particular, reach out with your comments. I think it's the easiest for you uh, to drop your thoughts on the podcast, so I, I, I enjoy hearing from you there. I'm sorry I've been a little bit behind on picking those up. It's coronavirus stuff, man. It's been weird. Can I take a second and talk about that? Who cares what I think about the disease in general? Obviously, it's terrible. But I will repeat, I guess, just the as we as we close out this podcast, repeat what I asked of people a while back already. Just be excellent to each other. It's the golden rule. Be excellent to each other. Put into five words. I think that's pretty good advice at all times. But especially now, people need your grace and your mercy more than ever. People are stressed out. I'm not particularly stressed out, but that's just kind of my personality. Uh, I don't tend to get stressed out by a lot of stuff, and I think it's probably just my stressed out meter has been burned out by <laughs> stressful situations. So comparatively, being told to stay home for a few weeks and work from home and stuff is not that, that big of a deal. But I realize... There's a lot of people who do not feel the same way about it as I do. And if you're, if you're one of those people, I hope this podcast helps. I hope just talking about football stuff for a while makes that other stuff go away. Uh, because I know when I've gone through hard times, that's what helped the most. Whether it was playing basketball, watching a movie I like, playing video games, listening to a podcast that I really enjoy. That's the stuff that helps the most. Just that normal feeling stuff. So if this podcast can be that for you, that's great. If you'd prefer to just kick back and, and listen to draft stuff, I, I totally get that. If you want to talk about other stuff, you know where to find me. You, we can talk about that stuff too. Uh, but just be excellent to each other. Do your best to hang in there. We can all get through this together.
the draft has come in one way or another, right? Um, whether it's in April, as the NFL says, or sometime in the summer, who knows? Uh, but it'll be here eventually. And when it happens, we will talk about it. Let me know your thoughts. I'd be interested in hearing from you. Uh, that's all I've got for you in this episode. Do well. Help each other become smarter Packers fans. Enjoy the book club as we all get smarter together. Because as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans. And better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time.